from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. We come into worship only because there is a God who offers us grace, mercy, and peace. You may come in today and think you don't have much to bring into the worship service. Uh, Indeed, what you bring is yourself who has been invited into the presence of God, drawn in by His grace to come and worship. And we're particularly called to worship in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Timothy has many exultant celebrations of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16, speaking of Jesus Christ, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. This is our confession of worship of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we are here to give Him that praise today. We're going to sing in Psalm 33, Psalm 33C. Psalm 33 is almost like a sung catechism or a, a, a creed that you could sing. It moves through the doctrine of creation, the doctrine of God's providence and rule over history, uh, the doctrine of God's saving love for His people, and we sing through our confession of faith in a psalm like Psalm 33. In 1 Timothy, which we're uh, diving into and which we've already heard from in our call to worship, there is much reflection on the sound doctrine, the core testimony of faith. And what Psalm 33 helps us see is that's actually something we can sing about. So let's stand for 33C.
pray. Lord, you are the God who has created the heavens and the earth. Lord, you are the God who spoke and those things came to be. And Lord, we rejoice in that speaking out of your creative power uh, this morning. Lord, many in our community have uh, rejoiced and celebrated in your creation even in the past week and seeing it in new and, and fresh ways. And Lord, just as we can rejoice in your spoken word in forming this world, we rejoice in your spoken word given to us in your scriptures that we might have light and understanding, that you would shine the light on our way, uh, a light for our path. Lord, would you shine your lights in the face of Jesus Christ on us this morning, that you would shine down on us, that we would see you clearly that we would give you the glory, that we would rejoice at the splendor of the majesty of God. Lord, we come here and we recognize that as you look down from heaven, you see who we are. And you remember that we are but dust. We are frail. We are weak. We are sinners. We come before you, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. So Lord, would you cause this morning that we would know again that your covenant love is upon us as we hold to you and the hope that we claim. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. We're going to read in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 2, we're going to read Proverbs 2, 1 to 15. We saw last week that 1 Timothy is a father-son letter. Paul sees Timothy as his true child in the faith, and in many ways then, 1 Timothy echoes the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs opens with a series of words from a father to a son, and we are listening in, in a sense, in Proverbs of words of Solomon to his son, maybe a future king, but we are listening in a very real sense to the words of our Heavenly Father, speaking to us, guiding us in the way of wisdom warning us about the false teachers and the false ways, which we'll see much of later in 1 Timothy. Consider now Proverbs 2, 1 to 15. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver, and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of His saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech, who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil, men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways." We see that the son there in Proverbs 2 would have those who spoke that which was of the way of darkness, and there was a call to avoid that. And the best way to avoid false teachers and to be ready for them when they come is to be treasuring the Word of God day after day, seeking after that as for hidden treasure, and as our pursuit is in that direction, Proverbs 2, 1 to 5, uh, we'll be much more equipped to see when it is that. Uh, false treasure is being laid out in front of us. We'll turn now to Psalm 49. Psalm 49a, singing Psalm 49 is a bit like singing from the book of Proverbs. Uh, Psalm 49 is a wisdom psalm. And one feature of Psalm 49 is that it describes the fools who have a different way of, of teaching a different way of seeing the world and their own lives, and they think that they will last forever. They think they've really got it figured out and that people like you should follow them. 
As we move through that and reflect on their life, and maybe some of us will see that and think that's describing the way we approach life and the way of folly, we'll see that they, that they ultimately find the grave with no hope but we'll sing in the final verse what is the redemptive hope for the people of God. So let's stand for 49A. If you look at your life and you see that you've walked the way of folly and that death is your shepherd and you see that there uh, would be no hope for you, uh, do not miss what we just sang. Yet will God redeem my soul from death's grip me receives. There is a redeemer who redeems us even from the ways of death. With that hope, we come to the Lord now in prayer. Father, we do come to you We come to you calling out to you, seeking you, seeking your name, seeking that we would understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. Lord, we don't want to come to you simply because we have a list of things that we would like you to do for us, sort of a checklist of desires, 
and seeing you as an aid to get us there. Lord, we want to come to you for that purpose for which Jesus Christ came into the world, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Lord, show yourself to us in glory. Show yourself to us in power. Show yourself to us in truth that we would see and know you more fully. Lord, for many of us, as we go into this week, our minds might be set on a hundred things that are before us, challenges, weaknesses, frustrations. Lord, help us to hear the word of Jesus, that we would be devoted to one thing, to sit at your feet and to hear from you and to know you. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for being the fools that we just sang about. Forgive us for investing our lives in those things that do not matter for eternity. Forgive us for devoting so much of our uh, emotions and desires, devotion, commitment, uh, to things that before you are as nothing. And even using the gifts that you've given us, which we can use and return back to you in gratitude, using that to uh, prop up our own identity or our own worth on our own uh, merits. And Lord, we... We need your forgiveness. Lord, we ask that you would be to us the God of forgiveness that you promised to be, who throws our sins into the depths of the sea. Lord, we come to you this week in prayer confident that you are the God who hears prayer. We've sung of your power this morning. We've sung of your creative power and your love for your people. So we are confident as we come to you uh, with many requests far and wide. Lord, thinking of the nation of South Sudan, we ask for the continued advance of the gospel in that country. Thank you for the time we had with the Smiths here a couple weeks ago. And Lord, as they would uh, spend time here and uh, tell many about what you are doing there and then prepare to return, Lord, would you give them refreshments and then, Lord, enable them to serve you faithfully in that uh, in that country to your glory. Lord, we pray for the churches there. Lord, the churches need strong leadership, leadership that resists the temptation of the world and holds to sound doctrine. Many of the things that we will consider in First Timothy is uh, exactly what they need there. So Lord, I ask that you would sustain them to persevere, persevere in the testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, sustain ministries like the radio ministry there, that they that there would be a, a far proclamation of Jesus Christ. Lord, we think as well of the Bloomington Church, far closer to us. Lord, we ask that you would continue to strengthen their ministry. Thank you for uh, Rich Holdeman and Philip McCollum and their weekly preaching of the Word. Thank you for the many who are being brought to that place. Lord, give them wisdom as they uh, have the good problem uh, of not having enough space uh, there in their church and on their property. Lord, give them wisdom as they contemplate building solutions to continue to minister in that place. Lord, in our own city and community here, we thank you that we are not the only church that believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you've uh, placed other churches around us that seek to preach the gospel this morning. Lord, would you make the uh, announcement of Jesus Christ go far and wide in this city, sustain uh, local pastors and shepherds in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Lord, we think uh, in our own uh, church, Lord, there are many health needs, and uh, we ask that you would be good to uh, us in showing your kindness and being the God who heals all our diseases. Uh, Lord, I do want to pray this morning uh, for Evelyn, Lord, we miss seeing her at church, and we ask that she would uh, be brought to good health and able to return to be among us, be with uh, Regina and Heather and the family as they care for her, that they would uh, be sustained in patience as they seek to show your love uh, to her. Lord, we want to pray for Kevin and Christy this morning with their physical health needs. Lord, Christy in the hospital now, and we ask that you would be... Um, bringing her to physical health. But Lord, as we uh, announced or talked about last week, we know that the great need is spiritual health. 
Uh, pray that there be spiritual restoration there. Be particularly with Jeff as he seeks to minister and uh, sh- uh, present the gospel uh, of love and truth to them even today. Lord, we uh, want to pray as well, thinking uh, denominationally. Lord, we want to pray for the Stuyvesant family. Jeff, a uh, professor at our seminary and pastor. And Lord, we want to pray particularly for Tab, his wife, as she um, faces what seems to be her her final weeks or, or months of her life with the uh, cancer diagnosis she has. Lord, would you surround that family and that church with your love and your kindness? Lord, be to them the God who shepherds them through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, prepare a table before them in the presence of that great enemy and cause your goodness and mercy to pursue them and follow them uh, all the days of their life. Lord, you are a good God to us. Lord, you don't want to forget the um, Thank you, Lord, for the provision or the, your answers to prayer in terms of uh, our election on Tuesday night. And we thank you for the election of Scott as elder. And Lord, give us wisdom as we contemplate the next steps. And I pray that we as a church would continue to move forward in the fruits of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control together in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we anticipate the offering, thank you for the gifts that you provide our church, uh, the way you've been so good and gracious and abundant to us. Lord, would you bless that which is given, uh, that it would be returned to your glory. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to Psalm 119T. In 119T, we often sing Psalm 119 right before we hear God's word in the preaching. In 119T, uh, there is a sense of uh, longing for God to speak. Uh, there's a longing, there's a, you, we sing of, of weakness, of crying out to God, a desperation, uh, a kind of, Lord, if you don't speak to me in love by your word, I have no hope. Uh, and that's a great prayer as we come to the word of God. Uh, and as we uh, return the offering, as prayed, we want to just be thankful for the ways that God is providing for us. So we'll remain seated for 119 Selection T.
in your Bibles now to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 7 is our text this morning, page 991, I believe, of the church's pew Bibles. Last week we discovered in verses 1 and 2 of 1 Timothy chapter 1, but also for all of 1 Timothy, we discovered this great theme. The household of God confesses the glorious faith as a family of grace. A wonderful theme. That is us, or we pray it's us. We're a confessing family together under the grace of God in Jesus Christ. That's wonderful. But how do we do that when those following evil seem like they're gaining on us? Psalm 119. How do we do that when other teachers and other confessions appear, uh, other ways of reading the Bible show up in our families, our churches, our communities, and our strength to keep confessing starts to grow weak? First Timothy answers those questions, verse 3 to 7, uh, answers them partially. We want to dive into the answers that we see in this text. Let's stand now for the reading of God's holy word. 1 Timothy 1, 3 to 7, Paul writing to Timothy, this is God's holy word. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. This is God's Word. Let's pray. Lord, would You cause us to not this morning walk away with confident assertions about things we do not know. Lord, do the opposite in us. Cause us to confidently speak of that which we know in your gospel, in Jesus Christ, in whom we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I wonder what in the Christian life or in the church, most frequently makes you look for the exit? What in the Christian life or the church most frequently, maybe you would never tell anyone that you think this way, makes you start looking for the exit door? Hold that thought and let me give a few examples by comparison. If you're in the workforce, what in your job most makes you ready to start scanning LinkedIn and think about the job markets? Or to count one more time your years till retirement and see if the number has dropped any since your last counts. Or daydream about a beach vacation that you don't quite come back from. Students, maybe you're thinking this now, it's April. What in your schooling makes you think, ah, how many days until summer? Those who follow politics or maybe just sports, what in your political party or your favorite team makes you want to cancel your subscription, change the news channel, find a new team, give up altogether. Most of you in one area or another of life, you know the emotion that we're talking about here. Some combination of I want to quit, I don't like it here, I may want to change teams, I'm not enjoying where I am, it's getting pretty hard. Now, take that emotion and then bring it back to the church and the Christian life. What in the life of the Christian or the church most frequently there makes you want to look for the exits? Either literally saying, I'm out, I'm done with this, take my membership off the rolls, I quit. Or maybe quitting in terms of serving and teaching and caring and loving in the body of Christ. Or Maybe just quietly quitting in the back pew. You can't literally leave. Life has constrained you to be in a place like this. But you've checked out years ago. 
Your physical address is still there. You're still in Ephesus, 1 Timothy. But your heart address is far removed. That's what's the tension. That's why Paul takes the pains to write a letter to Timothy so that the church and this child in the faith don't do that. Paul says, remain. No daydreaming. No exit plan. You've got work to do. Keep teaching. Stay in the faith. Stick with it. Continue to contend. Resolve to remain. That's the heart of our text this morning. Remain at Ephesus is the one imperative command you can find here in your English Bible. So family of God, hear this call today. We will continue to contend because there is a doctrine, a way, a charge, a path, an aim that is worth contending for. Not scurrying out of town when the challenge arises. Our approach today is to begin by understanding the opposition, just getting the lay of the land of these opponents that are there in Timothy's church and to think about them maybe in our own day. And then we'll find four truths to hold on to, to be helped in as we continue to contend. So we begin with understanding the problem. Here Paul is functioning a bit like the father in Proverbs chapter 2. Son, let me explain to you these difficulties that you're going to face. These false teachers that are surrounding you. Maybe uh, Paul here is a bit like the father who's talking to his son on the drive home from the baseball game. And the father says, son, you struck out three times from that pitcher. And you're going to face him again in the playoffs. And I think this is what you're missing. This is the way he's coming at you. You've got to be more ready next time. Here's Paul. He's, he's working with Timothy. And he's helping him see and understand what it is he's facing. And what Paul basically sees is teachers who have grabbed the Bible and used it for a different purpose than it was really intended for. These are Bible teachers, but they've got a different plan than what the original author, God, had for it when the the Scriptures were written down. Maybe you've seen, and it will be better for your life if you haven't seen it, but maybe you've seen one of those previews on television for the Winnie the Pooh horror movie. A. E. Milne's work goes out of patent, and this is what people think of, to make a horror movie out of Winnie the Pooh. And you think, I don't think that's what was meant for Eeyore, Pooh, Tigger, and so on and so forth. But people take it and co-opt it and use it for some horrible purpose. What you have here are teachers in Timothy's area, perhaps even inside his church, that are doing something like that with the Bible. They are devoting themselves to myths and endless genealogies. They, they, they see themselves as teachers of the law, verse 6 and 7. Likely what you have here are guys who grab what uh, those in the Old Testament would have called the Torah. Law, the first five books of the Old Testament. And in the Jewish uh, faith, all those books would be considered law not just the parts of that book that we think of as law, such as the Ten Commandments. They would grab onto all of these five books, the books of Moses, and you know this if you've read them, in those books are all kinds of genealogies. And in those genealogies are references to all kinds of people that we don't know very much about. And that can give room for speculation. And there's here a an idea from these teachers that if you probe in on these genealogies and start to speculate and start to think about what maybe happened in their life and uh, maybe come up with some myths that help us better understand the Torah, help us better understand the law, now we've uh, broken the code to really understand the way of God. And so these are the kind of teachers that would come into the Ephesian church, or maybe already be members there, and at the church fellowship lunch, they would pass out a flyer. Come tonight for a lecture on Genesis 5 and mythic readings on the life of Methuselah and the real meaning of the Old Testament. 
And at the gathering, if you decided to come, uh, you'd hear all kinds of snide remarks about some preacher named Paul, who we haven't seen in years. Uh, and oh yeah, these guys are actually thinking about starting a new church plant. The Ephesian church of the new speculations. And guess what? Some of Timothy's core church members are pretty interested in switching over. Or maybe already have. Now, you can imagine if that happened here that the church family would get pretty discouraged. Your elders, your friends would be weighed down. Really? You're going to take the one Sunday night we give you off a month after the fellowship luncheon and you're going to get together and spend your time speculating, developing all kinds of myths ancient people and genealogies so that you can have the real mystery of life and of God. And that might sound extreme to you. That might sound laughable. On the list of things you would say that would never happen. But if you see what's happening in Timothy's church as just laughable and impossible, uh, you're probably not going to really see the type of danger that he faced or that we face in the church. We could quickly pat ourselves on the back for not being interested in that sort of thing. But let's just consider what would make these teachers so attractive. Why would people go for that? Why would people in Timothy's day go for that? Where are we? Where or why might we uh, go for something similar? Let's think about it. These guys have strength in numbers and presence. They are framed as certain persons. Timothy is pictured here as one against many. Maybe like Elijah against the prophets of Baal. Who doesn't want to be found with the majority crowd? Who doesn't want to go with a crowd of people that are gaining popularity? Not only that, these guys have something new to say. Who doesn't get tired of reading the same books the same way over and over again? How about a new teaching? They offer a higher knowledge, a speculation, in a world of great mysteries... Uh, There are some that they feel like Paul and the Bible hasn't answered yet. Isn't there something else out there that can answer my questions? Maybe it's these myths that they've started to create, sort of jumping off uh, where the Bible stopped speaking and going from there. Here's something. They talk about the things of God, the law, the books of Moses, and they never have to evaluate their own hearts. You can pick up genealogical myths for dummies at their bookstore and feel very, very biblical and never get your heart evaluated. You grow in wisdom, you're growing in understanding, and you don't feel as bad as you do when you hear some of Timothy's preaching. And then these guys offer pride and status. They fancy themselves as teachers of the law, verse 7. They give themselves PhDs and invite you into their world of knowledge. Numbers, newness, knowledge, sermons that don't evaluate the heart, and pride sound like something people in our own day might possibly be attracted by. Maybe you're attracted by those sort of things. Once you see what's really going on here, you recognize this isn't actually all that far from our own experience in the 21st century. A new mythic reading of an ancient genealogy and the mystery it unlocks for us sounds like something a Bible teacher on YouTube could get several hundred thousand views uh, by offering for you to watch this week. Probably more views than most sermons get in uh, consistent uh, evangelical churches. You could also observe that, for example, the Mormon church is one of the fastest growing churches with quotation marks on it one of the fastest growing churches in our country, and they have all kinds of mythic readings of genealogies and of people like Enoch and so on from these books, uh, genealogies there in the Pentateuch. It's out there. This is our world. Maybe we should press in a little more closely. Sometimes in churches that put words like reformed on their sign, too can become all about all the details And facts of the Bible, parenting and teaching becomes about learning all kinds of information about the Bible 
Uh, and when our kids graduate from high school, they say, I, I actually have no idea what it really means, uh, but I did sit in a lot of Sunday night classes where I was given a lot of information. Sometimes people land in Reformed churches as a seventh or eighth denomination of their life. Maybe seventh or eighth out of the 10 or 11 they'll go through. And you discover that all they want in a church like this is something new, something to scratch their intellectual itch, a new set of teachers that make them feel smart, a new set of theology. It's the end theology of the day, uh, so I suppose I'll be attracted to them, teachers that give them a sense of status and importance among the simpletons of the world who don't have the real doctrine. Uh, your t-shirt of John Calvin, smoking a cigar, lets people know you're a real Bible scholar. And if you don't think that's in the Reformed Church, keep looking. This could be the mentality. We found some new teachers. We found some new way of thinking. Aren't we so smart? Let's move away from the simplicity of the truth. Family of God confessing grace. Oh, I, I guess that's important. But look how smart I am. Look how smart we are. Do you understand the problem? Do you see the temptation? Do you see how it can be out there in the world, but then that way of thinking can show up in our own midst right here? What do we have to face it? What do we have to carry on? Should we remain at Ephesus, or should we hit the exits? Should we go with a different doctrine all along? Four helps we can discern from this text. One, a doctrine that defines. A doctrine that defines. You may do a quick scan of the text and these teachers and think that the answer is to go doctrine light. Instead of Bible people, uh, we just sing the song, All You Need Is Love. Move on from the doctrines. Let's just be a people of love. Is that what Paul is saying? It's actually the exact opposite direction that Paul goes in this text. The fundamental problem of these teachers is that they teach, verse 3, a different doctrine. A different doctrine. Two words in English, one word in Greek, almost a technical word like our word heterodox. Hetero means other. Other doctrine. That's what's going on in verse 3. And it's not a compliment to be told that you're teaching a different doctrine. Different means there's a standard by which they are compared, and different means that they've strayed. One thing you might catch that some people will teach is they'll say that the early church didn't have a standard doctrine by which they were held, that that was something that was developed several centuries later in the church. The early church had doctrines, different ways, different sets of confessions about Christ. Paul says, no, there's a doctrine, there's a standard by which the church is held and to which the church must confess. Now, at this point, Paul doesn't define that true doctrine. Timothy already knows it. Later parts of 1 Timothy, like our call to worship, 1 Timothy 3.16, teach it to us. The great confession proclaimed among the nations, taken up in glory, Jesus Christ, the mystery of godliness. In some ways, Paul gave it to us in short form in verse 1 and 2. God our Savior, and Christ Jesus our hope. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. Timothy has this apostolic doctrine, this standard, this way of reading Christ in the Old Testament. He should read the, the law. He should read Genesis through Deuteronomy through the lens of the apostolic doctrine that he's been given, and not some other doctrine. And we have this glorious and wonderful confession. It's already called us into worship and guided us through our service this morning. And we uh, may be tempted to say, well, let's just throw it off. And we want to say, no, not only do we confess it, we confess it with conviction and joy and hope. There are some who say, you know, let's just throw off theology. Let's throw off doctrine, and let's just read the Bible with fresh eyes. Leave our theology in the corner, read the Bible as if we had no theology, and let's just see where it leads. That's maybe like saying, let's make ceramics, but let's do it without a mold, and let's just see what happens. Or let's, let's build houses, but this time we're going to do it a new way. We're going to have no framing, no foundation, and we're going to build houses. 
creative new housemaking methodology. It doesn't work that way. Our doctrine holds our confession together. By it, we read the Bible. We read life. I was reading this week on the life of B.B. Warfield, the Princeton theologian of the late uh, 19th, early 20th century. In his day, the word was, and you've probably heard this one, Christianity is not a doctrine, it's a life. And maybe you get what people are saying when they say something like that, the life of God in Jesus Christ. Of course, that may sound good, but it's the glorious apostolic doctrine that the church has confessed for centuries, announced to us by God, that announces to us life. And we need to be people. The world of all kinds of different doctrines say we're going to confess, we're going to confess the old doctrine all over again. Let's be a people who love our doctrine and confess it. Sometimes confessing it, and this can make us uncomfortable, means that we confess it against our opponents. That we're saying, this is the doctrine of Scripture handed down to us, and it's different than what other people are saying. We're not in a world where we say, well, everybody's got their own perspective on what the doctrine of Scripture is, what the doctrine of God is. We've all got our own perspective, and I don't like to be mean, so I'm not going to say anything negative about someone else's doctrine. We're just going to say what we tend to believe. Well, Paul says there's the different doctrine. And there's the doctrine that has been passed down to us in Jesus Christ. And part of what we've got to do is just stick with it. Persevere in teaching the doctrine. We can get tired and weary of it. Timothy, remain at Ephesus. Keep teaching it. An application for us as a church, many of our evening fellowships, both for children and adults, that's what this is about, learning this doctrine together, learning the shorter catechism. It's not that we grow weak on Reformed theology and studying the doctrines of the church. We grow strong in it and we understand its, its purpose for it, uh, the purpose for us in, in studying it. Come take our church information class if you're interested in that. We go through the doctrines together and we seek to learn to confess it well. A doctrine that defines two, uh, another help for Timothy, is a stewardship that serves. A stewardship that really serves the church, unlike these speculations. That's verse 4. These guys promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The word stewardship is the word for household. We talked about the household imagery last week. The word is actually oikonomia. From it we get our word economics. Ancient households with rulers would have an economy to them. Uh, they would have uh, someone who was over the household, kind of the first economist who, who would lead and manage the economy of that house so that it would be led uh, the way that the ruler of the house had planned it to be. That's what's going on in that word stewardship. What we have in the church of Christ is a stewardship, a way of arranging history, a way of arranging the church, a, a plan of God for all ages. This has come to us from God. We're speaking about more than just stated doctrines here. We're speaking about the experience of God's people experiencing God's rule and the arrangement of life, experiencing the gospel together. It's the economy of the gospel, some would say. Uh, maybe an illustration for us. Yesterday, our, our family stopped by Nexus Park, that new sports complex here in Columbus. And uh, Nexus Park is at least being put forward as something at the center of Columbus economy, uh, a building that's set up in a certain way for families to enjoy sports and recreation together. It's the stewardship for us of the Columbus Town Council, and you all are to enjoy it. Uh, the church is the stewardship of God that we come to by faith. He has set it up for us to put Himself on display, to put the gospel on display. We live out the economy of the gospel in the church as the family of God. What we got to see is those speculations might be interesting. Uh, the YouTube video might catch your eye on all those speculations. But compared to the house that God's building, that's, it builds you a shack that can't stand up in one thunderstorm. God is building a glorious house. He has a glorious stewardship, 
and you want to live in this house. Timothy needs to fight for it, and, and so do we. So false teachers, stop it. Stop building a house. Stop building communities of people that are obsessed with all kinds of things that have nothing to do with the life of God's people together in the church. We live in God's stewardship, 1 Timothy, and the way we worship, uh, the way we see church leadership, the way we care for each other, uh, the way we live together, the way we use our money and all of that, living out the stewardship of God that is by faith. And so one thing that's important when we think about the stewardship of God that's by faith is that we not just be a doctrine people. That's the first help. Confess our doctrine together joyfully and hopefully. But also a stewardship people. A household of God people. A people that love the way that He has arranged the church. The way He set up the church. One way that this comes about. Many communities that flow into different doctrines, actually become online, not in-person communities. That's their stewardship. That's where all their fellowship happens. We want to be the stewardship of God, the arrangement of God's house. Do what we're doing here. To be devoted to each other in fellowship. The singing, the classes, uh, the fellowship, and so on. We are a church of the doctrine. and We confess it with God's stewardship, God's plan, right here in this house. We have a stewardship that really serves the people. So a doctrine that defines a stewardship that serves. Three, a charge that changes. This is in verse 5. We've got a charge that actually changes lives. Verse 5 is a glorious verse. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. We'll hit the love part in our final points. But note the flow of this text. Uh, You can see verse 5 as Paul helping Timothy. He's got the arrow and he's trying to fire at the target. And he's saying we've got an aim. You've got an arrow that you need to fire. That's your charge. You're aiming at something. And how are you going to do it? What's going to enable you to aim in the right direction and hit the bullseye? Uh, And the answer is because you're aiming for love. And you're aiming for love that flows from a changed life. From a pure heart a good conscience from a sincere faith. These three terms, the the heart, the conscience, and the faith, are all what happens inside a person. The inner man, you might say. What Paul's saying is love is the aim, love is the outward, but there's real change on the inside. Paul's charge, God's charge, changes you from the inside out. All those speculations and myths... They don't change anything about your heart. They don't even address your hearts. But the gospel of Jesus Christ changes you from the inside out. That's the real change of the gospel. We're speaking to people who know themselves. Who know that their heart is not clean. Maybe that's you. Your heart is stained with sin. Psalm 51, I know my transgression. My sin is ever before me. And maybe you're attracted to all kinds of myths because they don't address the heart. And you don't have to think about your sin. But it still gnaws at you as you go to bed at night. You've never found a place to get that dealt with. And Paul says, we've got a gospel that actually deals with that. That cleanses us. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. The same apostolic confession that has come down to us in the ages, as I believe in God the Father Almighty, also says I believe in the forgiveness of sins. That we can be pure and made pure even if we're sinners. How about a good conscience? Sometimes we go to the trivialities and the speculations because our conscience is nagging us. I did that thing or I keep doing that thing. Maybe you think, I'll go home from church today where uh, my mind was... Uh, engaged with all kinds of thoughts, but I'm gonna, my conscience is going to be ruining me by the time the evening's over because I'm going to go back and indulge in that sin all over again. I don't know how to escape it. Paul, the great Jesus Christ, wakens us up. And instead of pointless knowledge, we can have a conscience that's remade by Jesus. A good conscience and a sincere faith. You see, speculations and making up myths aren't about faith. They're about guessing. They're about 
not really knowing what's really true. And some of us and some in our world are so afflicted by doubts in the realm of religion, they think that's the best thing you can get. But this apostolic doctrine, this Jesus Christ, Savior of sinners, can birth within you the miracle of a sincere faith where you can say, I I know what Jesus has done. I know that God has sent him into the world to save sinners like me, and I believe it with all my heart, and I know him. Do you see how this charge changes lives? lives? Do you see how Paul would long for Timothy to keep preaching that at Ephesus and not hope that Paul's inviting Timothy on a missionary journey so that Timothy can get out of this hard situation? Timothy's got a message that can change the lives of everyone in that city. And we still have a message that changes lives. And there's all kinds of teachings out there. And they get tired. And they get old. And they also get new because there's a new kind of version of it each and every day. And we think, why should I keep preaching the gospel? We should keep preaching the gospel to ourselves, to our kids, to our church, to our community. Because it's the only thing that can create a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. It's the only thing that can change people from the inside out. Maybe you've checked out on Christianity because you didn't realize that. You didn't realize what it can really do for your life. The announcement of God in Jesus Christ is to change you from the inside out, and it's offered to you this morning that you can be forgiven, and you can have a real faith in God through Jesus Christ. And so there's a charge that changes lives. And what that leads to, though, is hitting the bullseye. And that's our fourth help this morning. It leads to a love that really lives. A love that really lives in the life of the church. There's no love in just musing about these myths. But there is a love that overflows in the church. The aim of our charge is love. Just think about it. As you go into your parenting, teaching, shepherding, whatever it is you're called to. How you finish a sentence that begins with the aim of our charge says a lot about you. I asked you as a parent, what's the aim of your charge for your kids? You might say, so they can be quiet long enough for me to make a meal in peace. You ask a teacher, what's the aim of your charge to your, your, your students there? The aim of my charge is that they stop annoying me so I can spend less time with them and get on to the things that I want. You ask a, a, a pastor, a shepherd, what's the aim of your charge to your church? So that they just get things figured out and get the right doctrine and move on. People may not say it that way but the way they, they teach or shepherd may get there. It's important how you finish the sentence in your own life. The aim of my charge in life is what? The aim of our charge is love. Is love. And let's be clear. This is not the kind of thing where you're doing pretty well if you get the first three rights and miss number four. Where Timothy can come back to Paul and say, well, I did three out of four, 75%. That's a C. That's a passing grade, Right? No, if you miss the chart, if you miss the targets, if you miss the bullseye, and and you hit the wrong targets, you hit the target of the false teachers, that's an F. You didn't get it. The doctrine, it forms a stewardship, a way of life that is tied to a change of heart that produces love. And friends, if love is not overflowing in your life toward the people around you, towards God, if it's not overflowing in our church, if it's not overflowing in the way that we relate to each other, we should be evaluating. Have we actually gone off with the false teachers? Have we gone off into a different doctrine? Because that's where their doctrine leads. But we're called to love. We're called to a way of love toward each other. By this, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. It's a living love. Remember, the only way we got here is because of the love of God in Jesus Christ. And if we're not reflecting that love in the way we live toward each other, then it reflects on whether we've really experienced the love of God in Jesus Christ. This will take more work. It will take more work than just memorizing the shorter catechism to be a church. It will take more work to be the church of God than just arranging the organization and committee's right to reflect the way that God set it up. It'll take more work than just preaching the gospel because we preach the gospel and then we're changed and we've got to go actually love people. Is there someone here today or not here today but could be here who knows what doctrine you hold, 
but has good reason to think you don't love them? Is there among us an experience where we are short of love one to another? The aim of our charge is love. I mentioned very briefly earlier B.B. Warfield and his teaching uh, at Princeton Seminary and holding to the strong Reformed doctrine. Any description or biography you read of Warfield's life, though, hones in on another feature of his life. Warfield was a great theologian with all kinds of international opportunities for speaking and preaching and all of that. But the feature of his life that perhaps is most known is that he never really left his wife's side. She had, particularly in her later days, an illness and affliction that he really couldn't be away from her for more than two hours. And so the great theologian with all kinds of opportunities spent hours a day by his wife's side, reading to her, spending time with her. And the story is he loved doing it because he actually loved her. And the gospel had so changed his life that the thing that mattered to him was that this doctrine that he taught in the classroom, he'd walk home from his classroom and go into his house and love his wife. That's what the gospel does to us. And that type of experience needs to happen in this place over and over and over again for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for either being too focused on the, on, on the ways of thinking that don't tie into love. Forgive us for ignoring doctrine that you have given to us as your glorious announcement in the world. Lord, instead, make us those who, who, who know the aim of the charge to be love, pure heart, good conscience, sincere faith. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 27D is our psalm. In 27D, we have the great confession of faith. Oh, what if I had not believed? Stanza 14, the third stanza will sing. I am by faith assured that in the land of life I'll see the goodness of the Lord. We have a faith that's worth confessing. Let's stand for 27D. people said. 150A.